It has now been almost half a year since the release of the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Just let that sink in. Half a year. That's crazy to me. And not only because for the longest time most assumed this thing was never coming out. And who could blame them? From kindless delays, to script changes, to directors continually dropping off the project. But also crazy because... Nobody talks about it. Okay, well, not nobody. But considering this was one of the most highly anticipated video game movies of all time, along with the intense marketing push for it resulting in it breaking a bunch of box office records, it's strange to me that it seems like the only time I hear about it now is in reference to its upcoming sequel, with news finally beginning to trickle out about it. Mainly that... It is indeed happening. Glad to get confirmation on that. Now, of course, lack of continued discussion can't be used as an indicator of a film's quality or anything. However, when it comes to the FNAF movie, it seems that the general consensus is all over the place. It got pretty terrible reviews overall, but general audiences seem to love it. Even a lot of folks out there who haven't experienced the greatness that is Freddy Fazbear before. Over time, though, in the odd case of it actually being brought up, it never tends to be in a positive way. I asked my followers on Twitter, or X, what they thought of it, and I was genuinely shocked to see the replies leaning way more heavily on the negative side. You know, if you did that when the movie was first coming out, you'd have to start looking over your shoulder when walking on the street out of fear of getting jumped by a guy in a chica mask. I know back when it came out, I'd made a quick little video going over it along with my initial thoughts, which was much more in the middle of things, not thinking it was terrible or anything, but very surface level. Like it rode the line of being just fine enough for most to gather and rejoice at the fact that it wasn't the train wreck it so easily could have been, if they went with some of their previous ideas like having the Freddy gang be plush toys who take over the city or having a guy find an old animatronic at a pawn shop. I can only imagine the reactions. But instead, they reworked things, tried to stay as closely to the source material as possible, and because of that, most fans really loved it. With the Prius mostly going towards the authenticity and how well that translated the look of the game to real life, with most of the criticism then highlighting its boring piercing, rushed ending, and possibly worst of all, that it isn't scary. Which is kind of bad news for... a horror movie. Made by a company that almost exclusively makes... Horror movies. Damn. So, now that I've had some time to think about it more, as well as getting the chance to watch the film a couple more times to gather my thoughts, how did I come out of it now? Did my perspective change? Did it only serve to reaffirm my initial thoughts? Well, uh, I guess that's kind of what we're here for. Should probably just get on with it. Uh, but first, you know what's a whole lot scarier than Freddy Fazbear? Uh, YouTube sponsor. This video is sponsored by Storyiverse. Storyiverse is a new app for edgy short animated stories. It's like an evolution of comics and graphic novels in a new read-watch format for those who love a good story, but just don't want to read. I've been there. They work with different creative writers and animators all over the world, making sure each story stands out and is original. They've got all types, 2D, 3D, anime, and way more depending on the artist. They got everything from sci-fi to comedy with a bunch of stories you won't find anywhere else. I really enjoyed a god of ones and zeros. The art style is great along with it being a very fun idea of an all-ruling AI god contemplating deleting all of existence. This app really offers something unique that you're not going to find anywhere else. It's available on the app and Google Play stores for free. And be sure to give them a follow at Storyiverse for upcoming trailers and behind-the-scenes content. And thanks to Storyiverse for sponsoring this video. I guess to start, it's probably worth clearing up some stuff before jumping right into it, just so you can anticipate how I'm going to be approaching some of the criticism I make. Because to get it out of the way, I still don't really hate the FNAF movie, despite having many, many, many talking points when it comes to what I don't like. Is it a good horror movie? No. Is it a good movie in general? Uh, debatable. But is it a good FNAF movie that at the very least left me satisfied? Yeah, kinda. My main feeling of grief mostly comes down to what I wish it did differently rather than what's actually in there. Even if there are plenty of fundamental problems with the movie itself. We got this new flavor, Rainbow Explosion. I bet you'll go crazy for it. I'm hungry. I can't wait for dinner. And so I want to make it clear where my mindset lies in relation to giving critiques against the movie on its own, versus giving feedback that's essentially just fan fiction for an entirely different film altogether. Because the Five Nights at Freddy's movie was under that almost decade-long production cycle, it unfortunately had the consequence of immensely raising expectations. 
You know, I've waited nine years for this, it better be good. But also, it gave folks ample time to theorize and envision what their own ideal FNAF movie would look like, where it would pull from the lore and what to make up for itself, and how far it should lean into the atmosphere of the original, which contrasts against the slightly more kid-friendly approach they have now. Now, obviously, because the movie is only able to take one shot at adapting the first game, it's something they had to make sure they got right, especially when planning around keeping folks invested enough for a potential trilogy. You mess that first one up and you're fucked. And so understandably, Blumhouse went with the safest route imaginable. That's not really a negative, but I do find it reasonable why some folks were upset at this interpretation. There was no way they were going to please everybody, and so it appears they tried their best to make everyone as happy as possible without leaning too far in any direction. Some people wanted an adaptation of the Silver Eyes book, which fleshed out a story that took place in the original FNAF 1 location while still introducing us to a bunch of new characters, a whole world, as well as naturally weaving in elements from future stuff, like bringing in Springtrap at the end despite not initially appearing until FNAF 3 in the games. There were some who wanted a more direct FNAF 1 adaptation with little to no focus on what came after with the sequels and books and… whatever this is. It had a really unique atmosphere that we never quite saw replicated the same way the more the franchise started to expand. So of course when making a movie around it, it's only expected to have some people who want them to focus on accurately showcasing what that game was about, with a more quiet tone and avoiding certain pitfalls that some believed marked the decline of the series. Then there were others who actively wanted to see it start pulling in from the other media. We already know the actors have signed on for a trilogy, so why not think through how all these movies will connect to each other, and find ways to hint at that in this first one, so that when Five Nights at Freddy's 3 comes out we have a satisfying complete trilogy. You know, it's an adaptation, not everything needs to be directly one-to-one. -one. And so, which of these did Blumhouse end up going for? Um, kinda all of them, somehow? It may sound weird to say considering all these wishes directly contradict each other, but the Five Nights at Freddy's movie and its quest to satisfy everyone just sort of combined every one of these ideas to… mixed results. We have elements from the first game like the simple setup, the security room with Mike having to keep an eye on the animatronics, yet there are still hints of the later games in there like Security Breach with the character of Vanessa and other fun easter eggs like Balloon Boy or Ella from the books. There's also a guy with a Midnight Motorist t-shirt, or the Jimmy Neutron Rainbow making a quick cameo, as well as even taking some inspiration from the aforementioned book series, mainly the ending being an almost direct copy. I get the mindset here. Everyone, in theory, should be happy, right? Not the keys. Because of all this, they only really ended up satisfying the folks out there who didn't care what path they decided to go on and just wanted to see Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Clyde accurately represented on screen. And that's perfectly reasonable. If that's all you wanted, then I can't blame you. I envy your satisfaction, if anything. And there is a part of me that feels the same way. It's no secret at this point that I'm a huge fan of the FNAF series, and so there was a simple joy in just seeing these characters in the pizzeria on the big screen. I laughed when Matthew Patrick showed up to say the line. It's just a theory. Are you Rest in peace, Mitt Pitt. It's just unfortunate that part of me is buried beneath an assortment of thoughts that can be boiled down to… damn. That could have been cooler. And that's what I kinda wanna clear up before truly delving into the film itself, because there are gonna be times here where I talk about a certain aspect I didn't like and wish was replaced with something else, or choices they made which I believe to have hindered the overall experience. And I understand to some why that can seem almost unfair in a way. You know, judge and critique the movie on what it did do, not because you would have rather it done something else. Personally, I think that someone's response to certain decisions being, I wish they did this instead, is completely valid on its own, even if it doesn't really work as a point in and of itself. Five Nights at Freddy's means a whole lot to millions of people around the world, and so if you paid money to see a movie based off it and weren't happy, that's entirely fair in my books. But for me, I'm gonna try and keep any criticism like that to a minimum. And specifically when I do make a point like that, I wanna make sure it's in a way where the movie would not only still work with everything else staying the same, but also why I think it would end up making the movie work better overall. Think of it as less, I wish they did this instead, and more, this works, but maybe if they did it like this, it would work better emotionally or create more tension. Got it? Great. Let's get into it. By the way, I recently launched a new channel with mega compilations of past videos revolving around certain topics with loud noises cut out and spliced together in a natural way so that it's unintrusive when listening to it as background noise while sleeping or drawing or working your night shift, I guess. Just don't forget to check those cameras. <laughs> See, you're not gonna find that stuff over there. I got a five hour FNAF one up there right now where I talk about all the games and books and other fun stuff. So be sure to check it out and subscribe if you wanna. We're almost at 10,000. Thanks. 
I think the most perfect example of this movie going in the safest direction possible would have to be with the opening. I speculated for hours on what hard this first scene could play on. I mean, this is a horror movie. Your opener is basically what you're selling the entire thing on. Horror movie openings are in a pretty lucky place where they can basically just work as their own little short films. All you gotta do is set up the main threat and what they're capable of in a quick, creepy, and most importantly, impactful way. That's literally the bare minimum. Not all do this, of course, it's not a requirement or anything, but it's undoubtedly the best and most effective way of hooking a viewer in, if done right. Scream takes a long and drawn-out approach to raise the tension and genuine fear of having a murderer break into your house while you're alone. Nightmare on Elm Street has a quick but effective montage of Freddy Krueger making his little Wolverine glove, putting a ton of focus on how sharp the blades are. And of course, the most horrifying movie opening out there, Look Who's Talking. I didn't need to see that. And considering that, I think the Five Nights at Freddy's movie opens pretty decently, about as well as they could've. Yet saying that, they still avoid what, in my opinion, without a doubt would've made the most sense given the whole jumping grind for the story. It's just a night guard getting spooked by the animatronics and trying to make his escape before presumably being killed by Clyde in the most PG-13 way ever. <laughs> It's alright, sets the stage for a new night guard being needed and lets you know that these things are out for blood. Little team and that's gonna wind up being a running theme of the film, but it works. Also, I think if this were indeed Markiplier playing the night guard like initially planned, it really would have lessened its impact. Because there is no way most people wouldn't be immediately taken out of the movie to giggle and awe at the sight of the man who said, Was that the The film overall really struggles when it comes to how it wants to present itself, and the planned Markiplier opening showcases that perfectly. At times, it feels like they couldn't tell whether or not they wanted a serious, atmospheric, and scary tone that takes itself relatively seriously, or a dark comedy filled with fan service catering directly towards the fandom. Aware of the fact that they don't need to bother too much with the horror considering most of the fans don't even play the games. Not that I think Mark couldn't have pulled it off in a serious way, but it's undeniable it would right off the bat set a tone that this isn't something to be taken with any real modicum of seriousness. Saying all that though, I can't lie and say that I didn't wish they went for the much more fitting and honestly cooler opening that was sitting right there. And of course, I'm referring to The Bite of 87! For those unaware, all two of you, the Bite of 87 is one of the most monumental moments in FNAF history. The fourth entry in the series building up to this moment over the course of the entire game, where we see a lonely kid who is evidently terrified of the FNAF animatronics get picked up by his older brother and his mean friends, and brought closer and closer to the mouth of an animatronic Fredbear, kicking and screaming, before his tears trickle down the suit and cause the bear's mouth to clamp shut, killing him and shutting down the restaurant. Doesn't that just sound like the most perfect Five Nights at Freddy's moment you'd want to see adapted in live action? Also, I do know this isn't technically the Bite of 87. More likely the Bite of 83 because Scott Cawthon's a little jokester like that. But it's what my and most people's mind jumps to when they hear the Bite of 87. Thanks, other Mark. What if we opened on a parent taking their kid to Freddy's in its heyday, packed and bustling? We see the kid trying his best to stay clear of Freddy and gang who are surrounded by kids dancing to the band. Maybe after things calm down, we have him slowly start to approach Freddy, trying to conquer his fears before... I don't know, a couple bullies come over to fuck with him by picking him up to get a closer look, we get a sweet POV shot looking inside the mouth of Freddy, getting the chance to see just how massive and bulky he is. Before WHAM! You don't even need to show it. Cut to black as we hear a bunch of screams. That would have been a whack cooler opening. Not only do we get actually see Freddy's up and running, which the actual movie never focuses on aside from a quick little VHS employee training video, not only does it establish the spring lock failure and the fact that these animatronics are more dangerous than they seem, as well as the inciting incident for why Freddy's was closed in the first place, but also, like, it's a kid getting their head chomped off, dude. How rad would that be? It would be so effectively setting the stage for the fact that not only are these guys a threat to the security guards, but also to kids. I don't know, sorry if I'm immediately going into that fan fiction territory where I just give my version of a scene and call it better. I hope that's not what this comes off like. Because what I mean is, I genuinely think setting the stage in a way where we get to see the absolute worst of what these animatronics are capable of would have been way more impactful. Naturally, this would have never happened for various reasons. I think the main one being that killing kids is a bit of a touchy subject in even the most gruesome of horror films. Not even Saw could do that. And so naturally, Blumhouse's PG-13 silly bear movie wasn't even going to attempt to touch that with a 50-foot pole. But alas, I can dream. Or I could just watch The Hug. This short film that Hulu released that's pretty much just... Exactly that. And I don't want to hear any of that, but none of the original animatronics did the bite. Fuck, I don't care. 
It's an adaptation. It's fine if not everything is one-to-one. -one. We all know how complex and messy the FNAF timeline is. If anything, this is your chance to start over, clean it up a bit, maybe cut down on the characters. Either way though, the opening we got is ultimately unimportant for the rest of the movie. Again, it's just to establish that the place needs a new night guard as the others are disappearing. The film wants us to see everything through the lens of its main character and why he's been put into the situation. Sad main character being Mike Smith, played by... Every time I try to say his name that happens, I don't know what to do. L look jo He's been having extreme trouble keeping a steady job, consistently getting fired for general incompetence. Like, beating up innocent men thinking they're child kidnappers. But just, just innocent, innocent men. men. Keeping a job is important for the guys, he's gotta take care of his little sister Abby now that their parents are no longer in the picture. Especially with their evil aunt scurrying around, wanting to take custody of Abby for... the child support money. Wait, what? Okay, I narrowed down the FNAF movie to having taken place in Minnesota, and by I, I of course mean I saw a Reddit post that said that, and I have no reason to not believe them, they seem to know their stuff. I then proceeded to get confused on how to use this Minnesota child support calculator, and so just ended up settling on the fact that the highest number I saw in relation to child support there was $600 a month. What is that, like, three grocery trips? Most of that is gonna end up going to field trip payments and Robux gift cards, is it really worth it? That's rather nitpicky, I'll concede on that. I just think that this character feels completely out of place because I genuinely don't know why she wants Abby. Again, the money isn't that much. Point is, I honestly don't get why she's here. I mean, I know why she's here. To serve as extra motivation for Mike to want to keep Abby, she clearly doesn't want to be with this lady. But I think the issue is they went too far with her. She's too mustache twirly, literally having fucking meetings over coffee about potentially killing Mike to get custody. This would be fine in a comedy or a kid's movie, where a flat character like this is okay as long as they're funny, but here? Where she's meant to act as a focal point of motivation for Mike? She just feels unnecessarily comedic. Like, why couldn't she just genuinely care about Abby's well-being and not trust Mike? Why don't we just kill him? Tempting. I assume it's so we wouldn't mind when she eventually gets killed by Golden Freddy later. You know, pretty much the only major characters to die by the animatronics here are guys that the movie grinds to a halt to establish being bad. But is it just me, or is it not more memorable and impactful when a character you actually like dies in a movie? Not even like necessarily, a character that you can believe as a real person. I'm gonna talk about it way later, and I know this is a pretty controversial topic surrounding criticism towards the movie, but when it comes to stuff like this, it's hard not to see the PG-13 rating as anything but a detriment to the film. And not because, I didn't get to see Freddy Fazbear paint the walls of the pizzeria with the blood of his victims, but because an age reading like that holds back much more than just the violence. It restricts the intensity, resulting in a film that's only willing to be violent and edgy when it's a character that they make sure you know is a bad person. Whatever, again, I'll get into that later. For now though, we have Mike's sister Abby, which I think is a character that works well in theory. Again, these animatronics were designed for kids' entertainment, so having our main character be responsible for a kid who's at clear risk when put near these guys is a cool idea and one that does a great job at building suspense. But on the other hand, introducing a main character like that results in the problems that can arise with having a kid actor. <laughs> hey! Follow me! Again, touchy subject. I know a lot of folks out there who liked Abby, and at the end of the day, she's just a kid. Who is also clearly a fan of FNAF. And so getting to be the poster child for the movie franchise... must be cool. I'm envious. But at the same time, I just don't think she helps the movie at all with her performance. Only leaning further into the idea that this is a horror movie... for babies. I hate you. Hate you, Mike! Of course, this isn't just on her. If anything, I don't really put any blame on the kids' part. More so their writing, and especially the poor direction. You know, it's their job to get a good performance out of the actors they choose. But at the end of the day, the performance of a child actor is incredibly dicey. More often than not falling into the completely unbearable category. While overall, I think Abby's actress did an alright job here, definitely could have been a whole lot worse. But I just don't buy it, mainly within her interactions with the actual animatronics. She's ten years old, yet they write her like she's seven, completely doe-eyed and soft-spoken, unaware of the clear threat they pose, acting like Mike is being completely unreasonable for not wanting her to get close to them. Again, though, it ain't like it ruins the movie. I feel like sometimes people interpret criticizing actors, especially kid actors, as some kind of personal attack, you know, it ain't that serious. I just felt that overall, more often than not, her performance wind up taking me out of the film. But, 
that isn't exclusive to her. These are things children learn to communicate almost exclusively through pictures. I'm aware I'm already starting off quite negatively, but I want to get it straight. For the first half or so of the FNAF movie, I was on board. I wasn't loving it or anything, but for the most part, I was thoroughly enjoying myself despite feeling as if some crucial aspect of the games were being ignored, aspects that I actively wanted to see adapted. I want to say for the first hour or so that keep this incredibly slow piece that makes you feel as if they're building up to something big. I appreciate them taking the time to naturally establish the animatronics being alive and stuff, all that was fun. The franchise is like 10 years old, so of course I know the animatronics come to life, you know the animatronics come to life, hell your grandmother probably knows the animatronics come to life, but I'm glad that they don't immediately start running around the pizzeria flossing up Mike on night one. Instead, I find it cool that they went with the approach of things gradually getting more and more spooky over time. Not only does it work for, like, piecing and all that jazz, but also it feels like a nod to the games, especially the later ones, where generally the first night will remain relatively harmless, the animatronics not doing much other than hinting at the fact that they're alive, with their advancements becoming more frequent and more antagonistic as each night progresses. With the most common source of scares in the franchise infamously coming from the jump scare, it would have been easy for them to abuse that, relying on mindless noises and animatronics lunging in your face. But instead, they take a slower approach that I liked a lot, seeing Mike get into the security office and learning more about this place by watching an old employee training tape. It was cool. They even include a couple fun nods to the game here too, like having it glitch out for a second with Freddy briefly appearing on screen. It's not scary, but I liked it. Saying all that though, the movie is missing one crucial aspect that I feel is all but ignored here, and that's the survival aspect, specifically in relation to Mike. See, while the opening security guard and the guys that lead a brick into the pizzeria have to deal with hiding and or running from the robots, Mike never really gets that moment. Anytime he's at threat of being harmed by the animatronics, the tone seems to be much more focused on the action than the suspense and scares. When the film came out, I remember IGN made an incredibly negative review where they stated their wish that the movie had incorporated more of the gameplay loop from FNAF 1. You know, having to keep an eye on the security cameras and making sure the animatronics don't get in. Everybody tore that review to shreds. You just wanted it to be one-to-one -one like the games? You just wanted two hours of someone looking at cameras? Obviously not reading further than the initial tweet's title. But I read the entire piece and I kind of agreed with it. The whole movie didn't need to be like that, but I think it was just missing that one scene where Mike is actually doing his job. Maybe after that part where he's watching the tape that starts glitching, he glances back over to the cameras only to see one of the animatronics missing. It would kind of replicate that feeling most had playing the original FNAF game for the first time, and that genuine fear that would come with noticing one of them had moved. But they couldn't do that, of course, because whereas in the first game the robots were stated to be in a free roaming mode and could walk around wherever they wanted, seeing you as nothing more than an endoskeleton without a suit, here they took the approach that later took center stage. Being that the animatronics aren't mindless malfunctioning machines, but instead simply possessed by a group of five kids who were killed on the premises, their corpses being stuffed inside the suits, which means they now have thoughts and emotions and telepathy for some reason. Not bad, I liked this in the book a lot, but I do find it to be an odd choice that in the FNAF movie there is no qualms about Mike simply roaming the pizzeria. There's very rarely any real threat because for the most part, the animatronics spend a majority of the film lifeless standing on the stage. And it's a little lame, I'll be real. I think the movie peaks once a group of delinquents break inside the pizzeria to tear the place apart, being all a part of Mike's aunt's evil scheme to prove his incompetence. Now, of course, because these are indeed bad characters who said bad things, they're open for killing. And so we see each one of them split up to explore the pizzeria before being picked off by Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Clyde. It's not fantastic or anything, again, I'm pretty disappointed that most of the kills end up happening off-screen, cutting away before anything too scary happens. But it's fine. The best part is without a doubt when Abby's babysitter, who was also employed by their aunt because, of course, walks into a room to see Freddy standing there, motionless. She starts to lean closer to him, looking inside his mouth for a kid she saw running around, and then... Was that the bite of 32? I think the reason why this moment works so well, and why it's by far the moment people talked about most when referring to the film's horror, is because of how they presented Freddy himself. There's a ultimately pretty minor criticism I have, mainly because it's clearly not the tone the film was going for, but I think if done differently would have greatly enhanced the atmosphere, and that's in how they use the animatronics. I know folks are mixed on the characterization of the animatronics themselves. At first, people were arguing about the red eyes, then the yellow eyes, saying they should be white. But what concerned me most was how much we see these guys move, especially their faces. I think I can safely say what greatly enhanced the creepiness of the original FNAF robots were that they looked emotionless, fake smiles, and thousand-yard stares. 
But when you give them so much facial movement to the point where I can actually visibly tell what they're thinking, like when they're looking angry or squinting at people, it just makes them less scary in my opinion. And they don't do it often, but when they do decide to cut to some shots of the robots on the cameras, I think they really end up feeling to understand why these shots were so cool and impactful in the game. Like, there's this shot of Bonnie and Chica looking at the camera and then slowly moving the cupcake down to crawl through the vents, which not only looks goofy and unrealistic for these robots, but... I don't know, it just looks so flat. Not just with the camera, but also the lighting. I feel like the easiest way to showcase the lack of style here would be by just showing you screenshots of the original game's cameras. The expressions here, especially on Chica, are fantastic. It's the perfect example of less is more. It's scarier that we don't know what Chica is thinking. All we know here is that the animatronics can see you, painfully aware of your presence, but you don't know what they're thinking. The lighting and fuzzy camera quality genuinely creating this unnerving atmosphere. Again, you don't know what they're thinking, but what you do know is that they're getting closer. Yeah, no, just give them angry eyes. I mean, we just gotta. How are people gonna know that Chica is angry? When we see them move, it only serves to make them infinitely less creepy. Because they're either moving like guys in suits, which they are, or otherwise they're moving like zombies, incredibly slow and hulking. Which of course makes sense, but when you see it in motion, it makes me question how any of these guys are effective at killing people. And clearly it wasn't for realism's sake, because Clyde runs around like fucking Sonic the Hedgehog. They're able to cheat realism for him, but no one else. Probably because his design makes it impossible to be worn by a guy in a suit, or walk around without toppling over. Yeah, that's probably it. They're clearly so starved for cool and practical ways for the animatronics to kill people that they end up just abusing the Foxy run. I mean, the Clyde run. It's used three different times with basically no variation in how it's handled. But otherwise, we don't really know what they do. Freddy chomps, Chica uses her cupcake, which I guess is also possessed by something we never find out about. Foxy whacks him with his hook and Bonnie. We never know, I have to assume he gives the ultimate bitch slap. But again, this is the best part of the movie to me, because we're actually getting to see the animatronics in a somewhat similar way to how they are in the games. Because other than that, we're just focusing more on Mike and his quest to remember who his brother's kidnapper was. By dreaming hard enough. So usually, instead of monitoring the pizzeria, Mike is using sleeping pills to ensure nothing distracts him as he tries to access the deep recesses of his mind for... closure, I guess. I mean, I can't imagine it's for any other reason. Officers, please, I just remembered what the man who kidnapped my brother 20 years ago looked like. 20 years ago. Uh, great, can you tell us what he looked like? Uh... It's a shame, though, that around the time I think the movie peaks is also the time they start introducing elements that I think ruins it. And by elements, I mean Vanessa. Again, Vanessa is a character from the newer game Security Breach, but they have retrofit her back into the original by giving her the role of a local police officer. Freddy's means a lot to her, and so she returns to keep up with the night guards to make sure everything's alright. Although it appears that she knows more than she lets on. Hmm... I dislike Vanessa so much because her presence does nothing but actively serve to make the movie less scary. Not only because having Mike no longer be alone for a majority of the time really makes him feel a lot less isolated and vulnerable here. Especially with a cop by her side, if Freddy gets too close, just whip out the gunner teaser. But also, because Vanessa is someone who they make a clear effort to point out and knows what Freddy's is all about. She knows why it closed, she knows that the animatronics are alive, she knows where the missing kids are. All information that she chooses to just sporadically give Mike over the course of the film whenever she feels like it. There are moments where she'll say stuff like, Oh, did you know about those kids that went missing here? Oh, <laughs> I mean, wanna see Freddy and gang? Let's, Let's dance! dance. Her willingness to let stuff slip out makes no sense when considering what her true role here was. Spoilers and shit, but we find out way later, again, because Vanessa just tells Mike after a while, that the man who kidnapped and killed those five kids back in the day was none other than William Afton, also known as Vanessa's father. <gasps> her father has ensured that his crimes will never be discovered by having her go to the Freddy's location to check up on the security guards, making sure they don't learn the dark truth behind the animatronics. But she makes no effort to do that! Mike pretty evidently doesn't give a shit about this place, he's just doing it for the job. And so all Vanessa does here is spite cryptic shit that only serves to make Mike more curious. One job. One. Keep him in the dark and kill him if he got too close. You made no such effort! You think if you were trying to make sure he didn't find out, you would encourage him not to sit and build forts with the fucking things? 
I can see the response to that being that Vanessa clearly likes Mike and that's why she wants to help him out, but not only does that not work for me, because the majority of the time she still chooses to give him information in the most nonchalant and cryptic ways, as well as not being very explicit to him about why he needs to not let his sister near the robots, but also, she starts to feed him crucial information as early as their first couple of minutes together. Why does she already like Mike enough to risk exposing her lifelong family secret? You're telling me she would have given this guy the same benefit if he wasn't old and bald? Maybe you wouldn't have died if you were in Hunger Games. Boy, this opening really wouldn't have made sense with Markiplier. More complicated than possessed robots murdering innocent people. They weren't innocent. You mean this guy? What the fuck did he do? Where's that movie? Again, that's all pretty minor nitpicks, but I stand by her being such a major focus here, joining Mike on most nights, just making things feel less scary. Playing FNAF is always made a little less tense when you have a friend by your side, you know? From here, they just go off the rails. I was sitting there in the theater thinking, what the fuck is this? Not because I wasn't liking it, but because it is absolutely the last thing I would have expected from the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. But I can see the good in it. I do get what they were going for. I just think the movie forgets that in order to make this goofier stuff work, they need this little thing called contrast. Now with Abby's evil babysitter dad, Mike needs to start taking her to Freddy's with him. Mike and I having to deal with his little sister, befriending Freddy Fazbear. Again, not a bad idea. Kind of that whole false sense of security thing, which I think works well. I know possibly the biggest point of controversy with this film came from the dreaded fort scene, in which we see Abby, Mike, and Vanessa having a fun little montage building and playing with the Freddy gang. And for some, this is where they checked out. The last thing they'd want out of the tone of the Five Nights at Freddy's movie would be silly. And this is that pushed to the extreme. Whereas others felt it to be a fun bit of characterization, further showcasing that these robots are indeed just kids. I naturally land perfectly in the middle of that, where I completely understand why it was put here and how it can work well, but it was just executed really, really poorly. With this goofy tone not being contrasted against anything, in a way that could actually make the fort scene pretty sad and scary, honestly. I wish the animatronics were treated more like lost souls. Like, that's clearly what they're going for with us seeing the ghost kids, but because more often than not they're just presented as normal kids who, you know, aren't scary or creepy in the slightest, it ruins that whole idea. You know, there's a way to make kids in a horror movie scary, and this is not it. <laughs> I don't know how they would work around this while still having the kids here. Maybe they could have done some effort in post to, like, blur their faces or something. Anything to visually convey how these are kids who don't know they're dead. But it would be creepier to me if they were treated more like they were in some kind of Freddy Fazbear purgatory. Not being aware that they were murdered in such a gruesome way and just wanting to play. Not even aware that they're in these robot suits. Which could create some suspenseful scenes with them and Abby where they don't know their own strength or whatever. But no, we see it many times they're completely aware of their Freddy Fazbear powers. What I think they really needed after this fort scene was a moment where the fun and game stops and shit gets real. Where Mike lets his guard down before realizing that these aren't something he should have his sister around. This is what they do, but it just comes from her strumming Bonnie's guitar and getting shocked. Wow, how scary. Something they never spend any time delving into is the fact that these kids' bodies were shoved inside the animatronic suits. This is revealed to us by Vanessa. Just telling us, but I think this was a serious missed opportunity to show us how horrifying of a scenario this really is. Like, let's be real, a bunch of little kids who were taken away from their families, killed, their bodies hidden, never to be found, it's a really sad concept. But the movie never takes the time to showcase this is the sad situation that it is. I think a much more creepy and somber way to reveal this over just being told is by following up the fort scene with them all laying there after having a fun time. Mike thinks for a moment that maybe everything is gonna work out just fine this way, that they'll eventually tell him who kidnapped his brother after enough time. Until he starts to smell something. He's never been this close to the suits before, but they stink. Ugh. Maybe after this you can have Vanessa decide to tell Mike the truth, that these things his sister is getting so close to are dead kids. Literal corpses. Then he can come back into the room to get Abby to leave, only to see her going up and hugging Freddy. We have a close-up as we hear these faint crushing signs as Mike's eyes widen. Holy fuck, there are dead kids in there. And then this can lead back into him deciding that things aren't going to work out this way and that he needs to let the aunt take care of her. Maybe this could be why the animatronics get mad at Mike and seek out Abby for themselves. Instead of them simply wanting to do a trade, yeah, the kids, like, talk to Mike. I'm shaking in my boots. <laughs> I just wish they took any obvious opportunity there to present this as the horrifying, despicable situation it was. 
Who knows, maybe there was an alternate version of the script where they did decide to delve into this stuff more and got rejected for being too frightening, but it's a horror movie. This was definitely a Blumhouse decision, Nye, let's be real. They've been focusing on primarily making low-budget, marketable horror films for over a decade, now, and the owner, Jason Blum, clearly knows what does well. And right now, it seems to be the PG-13 horror movie. For kids! I saw Mithrigan in theaters, and my initial reaction to that was, oh no, this is gonna be the tone of the FNAF movie. And I was completely right. Market your horror film around a merchandisable character that audiences will be sure to love. Keep the on-screen kills and horror to a minimum, because that might scare some people. We want it to be just creepy enough to stick a scary tagline on the poster. To ensure folks that this is indeed a horror film. But we wouldn't want them thinking this is too scary. We gotta keep that age rating as low as possible so kids can still see it. It makes sense, FNAF is a franchise where a majority of the fan base are most likely around that 13 age mark. And PG-13 isn't automatically a death sentence for a scary movie. You can do more than just be scary by having blood and guts everywhere. It's all about working within your limitations. But with a FNAF movie, it appears that going in from the get-go, the writer and director had basically already accepted that they were just making a dark comedy with a scary exterior. Like, what is this? The only issue they have here is, this is Five Nights at Freddy's, a series which entire starting point is, child murder. Of course, they had to include it in there or else folks would be furious, but there was clearly an effort here to distract you from that as much as possible, which is definitely shown through the lack of time and attention they put on this serious, scary topic, because if they delve into it too much, then that can risk upping the rating. Kidnapping and killing the kids? Uh, we can do it if it's pixel art? But there are kids in the suits, though. Yeah, so focus more on the silly aspects of that rather than the somber and depressing side. Well, what about the killer? Can we show him? Yeah, but be sure to make him as unrealistic as possible. Just exaggerated enough for us to get away with it. Think of him more as a villain than... Child murderer. You, however, are finished! Farewell, my Gushman. There was no real effort here for the movie to even try to take itself seriously. Now, of course, the idea of four walking, talking, anthropomorphic robots is an inherently unbelievable idea that some people were going to find funny, no matter the context. And I think the filmmakers were aware of that, too. And so sometimes, instead of trying to show why this goofy concept is to be taken seriously, they instead decide to lean into it, with jokes at its own expense. Like, I was laughing my ass off when Golden Freddy appeared in Abby's house and killed her aunt, along with the rest of the theater, might I add. Because I just couldn't help but imagine a scenario in which Golden Freddy had to actively walk undetected from the pizzeria to their house. And in case anyone wanted to suggest maybe the ghost kid used their powers to teleport to the house or something, the film instead chooses to say, No! He indeed did goofily make his way to the house where everyone could see him, proceeding to heal a taxi for a joke. This is the last thing I'd want to do if my goal was trying to make the audience fear for Abby, being lured back to the pizzeria to be killed. But then that's where I realized, oh, that's because that isn't their goal. This movie puts comedy and silliness higher on the priority list over horror or tension. And that's a fine direction if that's where you want to go with it, but it's not unreasonable for a lot of fans to look at this and just think, why? You couldn't have at least tried to take yourself seriously? Because otherwise, the only time they even really try to take this situation seriously is in that brief moment where Vanessa tells Mike the truth. And another showcase of this film's serious problem of tell, don't show. It's so bizarre, the movie is two hours long and has a bunch of fluff in there that felt unneeded. It's not like there was no time to explore this stuff. But the reality of the situation is, the movie didn't want to. Because it would mean actually having to address this terrifying concept. Maybe little Jimmy wouldn't want to ask his mom for a Freddy plush if it was explicitly shown that there's a dead body inside. I guess I mostly hate the Vanessa stuff because it leaves little to no room for interpretation. There's no sense of discovery for Mike. He's just told everything point blank, only when it's necessary. This movie is really missing that scene where Mike goes out of his way to actually research this stuff. Instead of Vanessa randomly bringing up the missing kids incident despite it actively going against what she's there for, what if we had Mike run across a stack of newspapers in one of the closets that topple over? He sees one that reports on the incident, revealing to him visually why this place closed on. That's where he starts to get more suspicious, especially with them starting to move and befriending Abby. Maybe he looks up an article somewhere that explains the Bide of 87 incident, or how the kids' bodies were never found. And upon reading, everything starts to click for him. He remembers the strange smell. He remembers the cracking sound when Abby touched them. That's the moment where he puts all the pieces together and decides not to take her back. Doesn't that sound like a movie with tension and suspense? He knew there's one place they'd never think to check, because... Why would they? I mean... Sure, it works! 
During this exchange, Vanessa also informs Mike that William Afton is gonna be here soon, which is poor timing as the animatronics are currently trying to kill Abby. Oh no. It sure is good that Vanessa just gives Mike all the equipment he could ever want to one-shot all the animatronics. Ah, scary. From here, William just unceremoniously appears from the shadows, donning a familiar yellow rabbit suit. The one he used to kill the kids all those years ago. I mentioned it earlier, but William Afton is just a goddamn supervillain here. He hits everyone and everything, even stabbing his daughter. It was pretty obvious he was the villain from the start in the way he acted, with Matthew Lillard being the one to give Mike the job at Freddy's in the first place after recognizing that he was the one to kidnap Mike's brother all those years ago. Not in a Freddy Fazbear's, just in the middle of the woods. We don't even know what he did with his brother's body. I guess he was just on a weekend fishing trip, saw an unaccompanied minor, and thought, oh, what the hell, it's the weekend. Other than that, he really has no motivation, other than protecting his secret, I guess. But even then, we don't even really know why he did it in the first place, other than just being evil. He's a very bad man. Very cruel man. This ending here takes a lot of cues from the books. His takedown is almost one to one, with all the animatronics even dragging away his body, which looks great. I really think Springtrap has the opportunity to be super scary in the sequel. I love that shot of him sitting in the room slowly dying at the end. But one thing I don't understand why they didn't take from the books that would have fit perfectly here is having Mike's brother not get kidnapped in the woods, but instead at Freddy Fazbear's back when it was up and running. The main character also having a missing sibling which was revealed to have been killed by Springtrap, which of course was then later revealed to not be their sibling, but themselves, us finding out that the main character was nothing but a robot duplicate the whole time, whatever. Just that nugget there is what I want. Mike's brother being kidnapped at Freddy's. Not only would that make more sense considering William has never been seen killing kids in any other place but Freddy's, but also, it would give Mike more of a reason to be anything other than a plank of wood the whole movie. He doesn't give a shit about what's going on, he just wants the pet check. He's not bad, I didn't hate him or anything, but I also didn't like him at all. He's kind of emotionless. Now I imagine a situation in which Mike's only option for keeping custody of his sister was to work at the same place where his brother died years ago. Oh my god, the drama. The scene between Mike and William would also work way better too. Be way more emotional. We have that moment where Mike declines the job, but instead of it being because of bad hours, it's because he doesn't know if he can handle the trauma of going back to that place, before basically being forced to after realizing it's the only way he can keep Abby. You can keep all the dream stuff too. Instead of him trying to remember what the man looked like in the brightly lit forest, it's him trying to remember who he saw behind the rabbit mask. Then the moment where Vanessa hands him the photo later on, it could be like, whoa, that's what I saw kidnap my brother, we- That's your father? Instead, William just tells Mike it was him. For fun. First I killed your brother. Now I kill you. You're pushing your luck, Scoob! The movie's ending feels incredibly rushed, which is especially troubling when you consider how slow the rest of it has been. Mike remembers Abby's teacher mentioning how kids respond to pictures, and so instructs Abby to make a drawing reminding the kids that William Afton was the one to kill them. And they see this because their souls, I guess, are also tied to the restaurant? Maybe? I also really hate that the cupcake is the only one to attack William from this point, the rest just standing there giving their best angry faces. It just feels so not satisfying to see William die, because he just gets a single chump from the cupcake before the spring locks start to clamp shut, piercing through his body. And his reaction is horrible, like he's trying to hold in his shit. <laughs> Apparently there was an alternate take of this where William screams and yells as he dies, but they didn't end up using it. I wonder why. I saw a lot of negative responses to the PG-13 announcement be met with fans defending it by saying the original FNAF game wasn't that gory, but I think that's forgetting that a movie's rating represents the limitations for a lot more than just whether or not there'll be an excess of blood. Of course that's a factor, but there is also the language that can be used, and not just fuck or shit. Again, not putting too much on the whole dead kids thing, and when they do it's nothing more than a throwaway line, not too much descriptive language can be used. Like having William getting violently killed by the Springlocks is somehow seen as fine if he's reacting to it like he just stubbed his toe, over a more realistic reaction. I feel the more real it gets, the more they risk upping the rating. As well as the film's overall intensity, like it's entirely possible for the FNAF movie to contain no blood and still be scary, but there is the risk there of it turning out too scary, which would still bring the age rating up. 
even if there was no blood in sight or all the harm was implied and done off screen. It's why they could show the aftermath of the guy getting his face ripped off, whereas while it was actually happening, this is all we get. And sometimes Blumhouse have re-released versions of their films that have a higher age rating, like Mithrigan for example, but all it really does is add a single fuck word, and a couple of the deaths holding on for a second or two longer so you actually get to see the damage done. That was the difference between PG-13 and Unrated. Although I think they used Unrated in that movie's case just for marketing, but... They made it clear FNAF was not getting that same treatment and Unrated cut. And it's because that version of the movie doesn't exist. It's not like they had all this cool stuff they had to cut and post, no. Instead, they actively went into this movie knowing exactly how far they could ride the line. And I think it's resulted in it feeling so team compared to what could have been. After this, the animatronics just walk away with Springtrap and the building collapses and... Freddy lets out a dino yell for some reason. <laughs> From here, we see Mike visit Vanessa in the hospital, take Abby home, and rests knowing that this chapter of his life is behind him. Wait, really? That's it? Everything kind of wrapped up a little too neatly here. Vanessa has admitted to not only being complicit in the murder of, at minimum, five kids, and being involved in the further murders of countless security guards. Hmm, I guess you're just conventionally attractive enough for me to know that deep down, you're a good person. But if you ever try to kill me or my sister again, why I oughta? Also, you're just... Not gonna tell the police about the missing kid bodies being inside the suits. We have buy all you want, but there are, like, corpses in there. Possibly with still alive parents who never knew what happened to their beloved children. It's very odd that this is something that is never acknowledged. Again, because if they do, then they actually have to deal with the tonal whiplash. Whereas they'd much rather end the movie on a sweeter note. Can we visit them sometime? Um... Hey, Mike, isn't, like... Your aunt lying dead on the floor in the next room? She was kind of murdered, um, literally last night and nobody has addressed it. The police never questioned how she died in your home. Wouldn't this be the perfect time to tell them about the kid's bodies in the suit? How about you tell the police that the killer is literally captured and immobilized in the restaurant? No? Alright, the past is in the past, I guess. Of course, this is so they can leave things open for a sequel, in which I can only hope they bother to give the film an ending that doesn't just purely exist to set up the next. And that's my thoughts on the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Okay, well, not really. Obviously, I focused a lot on the negative aspects there. Again, ultimately, my thoughts in the film lean more on the bad side. But that isn't to say there's nothing worth praising, such as the animatronics and overall feel of Freddy's. I appreciate the liberties they took, not making it one-to-one -one with the games. They went for a much darker aesthetic, avoiding the whites and grays of the game's location. I think that was to ensure that in scenes where they're in the main area, things don't look too bright. I think the whites would have been distracting, and so I appreciate the more 90s Pizza Hut feel instead of directly basing it off real Chuck E. Cheese locations. And despite me not loving how the animatronics were used here, I think they all look fantastic. It's not one-to-one. -one. Overall, I think the originals look a lot skinnier than the real-life ones used here. But that was clearly necessary for being able to have actors get inside the suits, but it works. And they all do look amazing. Chica and Foxy especially. I think overall, though, my biggest issue with the FNAF movie is that they tried to please everybody. With the Sonic movie ordeal from 2019, I think movie studios have finally understood that when making video game adaptations, making it actually look like the games you're adapting is important. Who would have guessed? You know, it's not as if that's the whole reason people are going. For a while, it appeared like studios were almost embarrassed to claim their films was a video game adaptation, trying hard to stray in a direction they think would appeal to more people, usually taking nothing more from the game aside from the character names and general outline. Like, okay, look at the video game Rampage, now look at the movie adaptation. But now with the success of Sonic and especially Mario, I think executives are finally starting to realize that to make a popular and profitable video game movie, you don't even need to make it good. You just need to show the audience enough of the imagery they would want to see translated on the big screen. Again, look at the Mario movie. That could have been nothing but Mario Randers being dragged across the screen for 90 minutes, and people still would have said, well, it's a kid's movie, what do you want from it? Or a better example in Sonic the Hedgehog. Again, all they did was change Sonic's design, the script said exactly the same, and it took what would have been a guaranteed 3 out of 10 to more, like, a 6. If there's one thing I can say about Jason Blum, it's that he's a smart businessman. He knew exactly how far to go to make the most serviceable, palatable adaptation of Five Nights at Freddy's possible. And it worked. 
And if you like the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, that's perfectly fine. Again, there is a part of me that kind of likes it too. The part of me who was satisfied with just seeing these characters on the big screen. The franchise has gradually moved further and further away from the horror, more so focusing on the sci-fi themes they've been injecting, quite literally in some cases, into the story. And while I'm not sure how the movie universe is going to delve into Remnant and all that jazz, if they even do, I do think that some stuff reaches a point of being too strange for general audiences that I'm sure Jason would like to stay clear from. But all in all, I do ultimately understand why they went in the more comedic direction they did, with it obviously making the film a lot more marketable. I guess it just disappoints me because the franchise is so far removed from where it began, with a good chunk of fans out there falling out of love with the franchise over this new approach. And so it felt as if this movie was the series' last chance to go back to that first entry, go back and give the fans of it a genuinely good horror movie that capitalized and expanded upon what made that game so creepy, the feeling of isolation and vulnerability it evokes. And then glossing right past that feels like missed potential we can never return to. I think it was just missing that 5-10 to 10 minute scene that really honed in on what made the original FNAF so great, having Mike actually have to try and survive his Five Nights at Freddy's. But alas, what do I know? General audiences loved it for what it was and it made a shit ton of money while building excitement for the eventual sequel, which we're just beginning to get news trickled out to us about at the time of writing this. Scott specifically mentioned wanting to take in criticism from this film and keep it in mind while working on the second, which leaves me hopeful for the follow-up. I guess the main piece of feedback I can give, though, don't be afraid to take this world and these characters seriously. You don't need to wink and nod at the audience that you're aware of how outlandish this is. You don't need to make every bad guy so overly evil so the audience doesn't care when they die. You can focus on the more real and scary elements that come with such a genuinely terrifying concept, instead of trying to act like they're a mere footnote, something to brush under the rug to ensure marketability. I just want the Five Nights at Freddy's movies to be good, but aside from a couple fun and genuinely cool moments here and there, this one just isn't.